Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ILOPathology.com. This is the part 3 of diseases of kidney. In the earlier parts, we have discussed the various clinical manifestations of renal disorders and we also talked about how the glomeruli responds to various injurious agents. Right. So, in this part, we will be understanding in detail about the pathogenesis of glomerulonephritis. So, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, we will see what are the causes of glomerular injury? What is the mechanism of glomerular injury? What are the mediators which are responsible for glomerular injury? And then we look into how the glomerular injury progresses. So, what is glomerulonephritis? It's just the inflammation of glomeruli, which is due to glomerular injury. What is glomerular injury? Glomerular injury is basically damage of the glomerular filtration barrier, and that leads to proteinuria hematuria and decrease in renal function. So, in the pathogenesis of glomerular injury, why is that we need to know in detail about this? That's because it helps in understanding the concepts behind various glomerulonephritis. Now, thus, it helps in diagnosis and management of glomerular diseases. If you understand the glomerular diseases pathogenesis, you will be able to treat these patients effectively. right? So, the pathogenesis of glomerular injury broadly uh, categorized are classified into immune mediated and non immune mediated immune mediated can be antibody mediated or basically immune complex mediated antigen antibody complex mediated or it could be cell mediated non immune mediated it could be due to various genetic causes could be due to metabolic causes or ischemic or toxic causes Whatever the basic pathogenetic mechanism, ultimately, these leads to release of inflammatory mediators, which in turn destroy the glomerular apparatus. Remember, this destruction can be either partial or complete, and that leads to loss of glomerular filtration barrier function. That is glomerulonephritis. Basically, there is loss of filtration barrier function. So, we look into the immune mediated causes, particularly the antibody mediated, that is immune complex mediated, that, that can be further categorized into in situ immune complex and circulating immune complexes, right? What is this in situ immune complex means? The antigens are there within the glomerular basement membrane. So, that could be fixed antigens or planted antigens. We will discuss in detail about these two. So, what is this fixed antigen? Basically, the example being alpha-4 chain of type 4 collagen, that's of glomerular basement membrane, whereas planted antigens can be either exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous, it could be various infectious agents, whereas endogenous meaning it could be DNA material or nuclear proteins, etc. Let's discuss in detail about this in situ immune complex mediated glomerular injury. Okay, the first one being fixed antigens. So, what do you mean by fixed antigens? That means antigen is already present in the glomerular basement membrane. In this case, this is alpha 4 chain of type 4 collagen of the glomerular basement membrane. We know that the glomerular basement membrane is composed of collagen and other glycosaminoglycans, right? So, this part, the type 4 collagen of the GBM, particularly the alpha 4 chain is acting as an antigen in this case. And remember, this antigen is there throughout the glomerular basement membrane. Now, when there is antibody to these antigens, okay, then these are basically anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies, okay, anti-GBM antibodies. And this, when we observe under immunofluorescence, you know, is seen as if the deposits of these immunoglobulin molecules, you know, along the glomerular basement membrane in a very linear fashion, linear fashion, and that we call it as linear deposit in the glomeruli in immunofluorescent microscopy. Okay, so this is how linear deposit in the glomeruli looks under immunofluorescence microscopy. So this is what happens in in situ immune complex formation, particularly because of fixed antigens. Now let's move on to understanding the planted antigens. Okay, now what is this planted antigens? So planted meaning you know they are not normally present, but they are planted onto the glomerular basal membrane. Because these, they localize in the kidney by interactions with various glomerular components. So, they are not normally there in the glomerular basement membrane, but then they are localized. 
Now, what are these antigens? They can be exogenous antigens or they can be endogenous antigens. Exogenous meaning from outside. It could be various infectious particles, that of viral, bacterial, parasitic and even drugs. Whereas endogenous which includes cationic molecules which interact with the anionic component of the glomeruli. And that could, be, that could be by various DNA components of other cellular material, could be nuclear proteins, could be nucleosomes, etc. Okay? So, they are not normally present in the glomerular basement membrane, but then they localize in the kidney, in the various parts of glomerular components. Now, that was planted antigens, right? So, we talked about immune complex mediated uh, diseases, particularly the inside to immune complex. Right? We discussed about the fixed antigens and then the planted antigens. Now, we'll move on to understand the concepts behind the circulating immune complex mediated glomerular injury. Now, what do we mean by circulating immune complexes? So, immune complexes are formed within the circulation, okay, and then these complexes are trapped in the glomeruli. These complexes are trapped within the glomeruli. Right? So, they are basically antigen-antibody complexes which are trapped in the glomeruli. Remember that there is no immunogenic specificity for any glomerular component. Now, the question is why are they even trapped? And that trapping is because of two important reasons. One, the physiochemical properties of these immune complexes. Two, the hemodynamic factors of the glomerulus itself. Now, what are these physiochemical properties we should be, uh, you know, understanding? They could be, they are of, you know, the size, the shape and the charge of these antigen-antibody complexes. The larger the size, the more cationic they are trapped. Whereas, hemodynamic factors meaning whenever there is high blood pressure, whenever there is, you know, shear forces of the glomeruli, the forces of the blood flowing within the glomeruli, for example, the turbulent flow, all these, you know, sort of damages the endothelium and that's where the immune complexes tend to get trapped. So, that results in, as I told you, damage to filtration barrier and they favor trapping of these antigen-antibody complexes. Again, the circulating immune complexes can be derived from either exogenous or endogenous sources. The endogenous ones, you know, they are the ones which are associated with systemic lupus erythematosus and IgA nephropathy, the nuclear material, that's what we discussed even in planted antigens, right? Now, exogenous ones, again, just like the earlier one, it could be associated with various infections, the bacterial products, surface antigens, particularly hepatitis B, C and even treponema pallidum antigens. In certain number of cases, you know, the cause for these circulating immune complexes is unknown. Now, let's understand this trapping of uh, circulating immune complexes. Remember, you have antigen-antibody complexes already formed in the circulation. They are being, you know, they are moving all around the uh, circulation. And then finally, they get trapped due to various properties which I told you, right? One, physiochemical properties and two, the hemodynamic factors. Based on this, they can be trapped either beneath the endothelium or on the glomerular basement membrane or beneath the epithelium. That's how they are trapped. Now, how do these trapped immune, immune molecules or immune complexes appear under immunofluorescence microscopy? They are seen as bright spots. You know, they are seen as patches. They are not linear as uh, we saw in anti-GBM disease, right? So, they are seen as bright patches when viewed under fluorescent microscope. Then that's when we call this as granular deposit in the glomerular life. So, this is how granular, diffuse granular deposits, in particularly this is a case of lupus nephritis, that's what we see. Granular, unlike the smooth linear pattern, this is bright patches or spots all along the glomeruli. So, these are granular deposits. Now, where are they trapped? We, we saw that why are they trapped, right? Now, where are they trapped? Why is that some traps, some are trapped? beneath the epithelium, some are trapped beneath the endothelium, we will look into this. The location of the trapping of these immune complexes depends upon the size and charge of the immune complexes. Let's look into this in detail. So, this is your uh, structure of glomeruli. And if the complexes are made up of highly anionic macromolecules, okay, they tend to look, they tend to, you know, localize in subendothelial location. 
okay if the immune complexes are small and cationic they tend to localize beneath the epithelium you know they can they can easily pass through the glomerular filtration barrier and then they can localize in the subepithelial region whereas the larger molecule and anionic molecule tend to repel from the glomerular base membrane membrane and then they are trapped under the endothelium they just don't go beyond the glomerular basement membrane Whereas if they are intermediate size and that of intermediate charges, they can localize, you know, on the mesangial cells itself. Okay, they just get into the mesangium because of interaction between the mesangial cell receptors and the immune complexes, the deposits might be mesangial. So, the deposits of immune complexes can be subendothelial, subepithelial and mesangial. It all depends upon the size and the charge of the complexes remember it is not just either of these locations it can be even in a single disease deposits can be located in all three locations okay deposits can be located in more than one location and this is all we find under electron microscopy so basically these are em findings electron microscopic findings now why it is important to know the location whether it is subepithelial or subendothelial or mesangial that's because you know they provide clues to the underlying cause and guide in the treatment how do they provide clues because we know subendothelial locations are basically seen in lupus nephritis whereas subepithelial locations you can think that this could be because of membranous nephropathy you know like for example the cause could be hepatitis b and c mesangial they are most often seen in ig nephritis they're most often seen in post infectious causes and that's so you know sort of you know you you get the clues as to what is the cause of this particular glomerular nephritis and then the management becomes much simpler if you know the location of these complexes so now we completed the various antibody mediated you know pathogenesis of glomerular injury now we will move on to the cell mediated causes but you know this is a very rare cause of uh, glomerular injury it's often found only in the experimental models the uh, uh, occurrence in humans is you know it's still an ongoing research so let's not give much importance to this cell mediated causes only important one is the in situ immune complex mediated this is the most common mechanism right so that's about cell mediated and the third important one among the you know immune mediated one it could be activation of alternate complement pathway now this is a new thing right now what is this activation of alternate complement pathway meaning so there is an impaired regulation of the complement system in these patients now what do we mean by impaired regulation of the complement system there is deficiency in the regulatory proteins of the complement pathways the regulatory proteins are often you know the factor h and the factor i they regulate the complement pathway so whenever there is a deficiency in these regulatory proteins there will be uncontrolled activation of the alternate complement pathway now what happens if there is uncontrolled activation of alternate pathway they that leads to deposition of complement components particularly c3 within the glomeruli and then that results in glomerulonephritis okay this is often seen as you know electron microscopically dense deposits and that's why it's called dense deposit this is and the impaired regulation is generally could be because of various genetic causes and could be acquired causes the acquired causes include and auto antibodies that target these regulatory proteins whereas genetic causes in, which includes mutations in the genes encoding these regulatory proteins so ultimately whether it is acquired or genetic all it results is deficiencies in the regulatory proteins and these consequences okay so remember uh, impaired regulation of the complement pathway complement system leads to dense posit disease we finished all these things now let's move on some non immune mediated causes the first one being genetic causes there will be mutations in the gene which of these are some of the genetic causes right when we talked about uh, causes of uncontrolled activation of alternate pathway alternate complement pathway right that's one cause and second one could be mutations in the genes that encode for the collagen of the glomerular basin membrane and one of the example being alport syndrome i'm not going in detail to discuss about these things just remember alport syndrome is one genetic cause of glomerulonephritis then moving on to metabolic causes could be you know this is this is quite common you know you, you have diabetes hyperlipidemia amyloidosis gout etc all these can result in glomerulonephritis due to various uh, causes 
we will be discussing each of these later. Ischemic or toxic causes include particularly drug induced, for example, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, chemotherapeutic agents, toxins like heavy metals, pesticides, etc., and ischemia because of renal artery stenosis. All these can result in glomerular injury and then subsequently directly causing glomerulonephritis. These are non immune mediated. So, we discussed about immune mediated, non immune mediated, and activation of alternate complement pathway. Now, now we know we will we'll just come back to immune uh, complexes. Now, what happens if there are immune complexes? Basically, we are looking at mechanism of glomerular injury in immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis. So, once there is formation of immune complexes, they activate complements. They activate complement and then they also engage the FC receptors on various cells, particularly the leukocytes, the mesangial cells and other cells and that leads to inflammation and then proliferation. Okay. Now, once we know that these cells are activated, the leukocytes, the in you know the the mesangial cells. Now, what are all the mediators which ensue the glomerular damage? The mediators meaning the you know the components which are synthesized by these inflammatory cells and the mesangial cells. So, what are the mediators? So, mediators can again, if you if you recollect the you know topic on inflammation, we talked about chemical mediators of inflammation, right? So, all these mediators are responsible for glomerular injury, particularly. In in case of renal injury, it could be cells and soluble mediators. Cells, as we saw, inflammatory cells, and these inflammatory cells are neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, and platelets. Whereas other cells can be resident glomerular cells, particularly the mesangial cells. You know, all these, you know, when they are activated, they release various cytokines, various chemokines, they activate the coagulation system and the complement factors, and that's how they result in glomerular injury and proliferation. Now we know what are the causes of glomerular injury. Now we know how these immune complexes you know, result in glomerular injury and we will see how the glomerulonephritis progresses. Now what is the mechanism of progression of glomerulonephritis? Now histologically the progression is seen in two forms. One, whenever there is a sclerosis of glomeruli, that is we, that, that's when we call it as glomerulosclerosis. So, when you see glomerulosclerosis, that means you're looking at an advanced stage of glomerulonephritis. Second important histological clue is tubulointerstitial fibrosis. So, glomerulosclerosis, tubulointerstitial fibrosis tells you that you're looking at, you know, advanced stage of glomerular uh, insult. What will happen? There will be gradual decline of the renal function due to the loss of functioning nephrons, right? Because you are, because there is no glomeruli, there is damage to tubular interstitial system, and ultimately that leads to reduction in the glomerular filtration rate, and finally leads to end stage renal disease. This is how the glomerular nephritis progresses if they are not treated in time. Now. Now, what is the fate of immune complex deposits? Now, we know what are all the causes of immune complex uh, deposits, right? Could be uh, inside to immune complex formation or circulating immune complex formation, whatever. What is the fate? What happens to these immune complexes? Now, it depends upon whether the exposure is very short-lived and limited or whether the deposits are there for prolonged periods or, you know, there is repeated attacks and then repeated deposits. So, if the exposure is short lived, for example, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, inflammatory cells which are released, you know, and the mesangial cells and the endogenous proteases eventually degrade the complexes. Okay. Of course, by then there is some amount of injury which have, hap which have had happened, but then they eventually degrade the complexes and then the inflammatory reaction subsides. Remember, that is only when the exposure is short lived and limited. If the deposits are there for longer periods, say for example, we are looking at uh, systemic lupus erythematosus or even viral hepatitis, there will be more and more injury and that leads to a chronic uh, form like you know, chronic membranous glomerulonephritis or chronic membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis and then there is progression, finally end stage renal disease. In summary, we talked about in detail uh, about the pathogenesis of glomerular injury. Just a quick recap, immune mediated, non-immune mediated, antibody mediated which is basically immune complex mediated which can be in situ or circulating. In situ can be either fixed or planted and then we move on to understand the cell mediated activation of alternate complement pathway where there is dysregulation of complementary regulatory proteins, right? And then 
there is few non immune mediated causes like genetic metabolic and ischemic causes so that's all we discussed today thank you for watching if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment if you have any queries to ask don't forget to subscribe and please do share if you find this video useful in the next class i'll be uh, discussing in detail about the the concepts behind acute post streptococcal glomerulonephritis stay tuned bye bye